Good morning. It's good to see you this morning, to worship God with you, to be able to spend this time of glorification to Him, the time that we can commune together as we have had opportunity to spend this beautiful time together and now the opportunity to study from His Word. Paxson just read a story for us from Mark chapter 10. We're going to read that story again, but this time I'm going to ask you to flip in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Now, we're going to see the same story recorded for us there, worded almost identical, but we're going to study from Luke chapter 18 together. And I I want you, as we are looking at this story, I want you to begin to establish some realities in this story. What are some of the realities that this guy had to deal with? What are some of the obstacles even that he had to overcome? That's what I want you to be looking for. So in Luke chapter 18, towards the very end of that chapter, we have this story again recorded for us. Listen to it and look for those things that we just mentioned. Luke chapter 18, beginning of verse 35. It says, Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. And so they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And and those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had came near, he asked him, he said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is an unbelievable type of story, similar to a lot of other stories that we read about in the Gospels, about Jesus and his interaction with people, his interaction with people who had blindness or other difficulties, interactions that he had in the midst of crowds even. But I want you, as we are studying, to establish a few realities. And the first reality is you have this man who was blind, doing at this time just about all that he had to do, beg. There wasn't much else that he could really be doing. There wasn't a lot of work at this time out there for one who was blind. He didn't have a lot of options. His option at the time was to sit where he was and when the people pass by, hold out his hand or something for them to put money in. That was his option. That's what he was doing. And he hears the commotion. And he hears the crowds moving. And he asks the question, well, what's, what's going on, right? There seems to be something happening. And they're told, well, Jesus, Jesus is coming through. And he begins to cry out for him. I want you to think about the obstacles that this man had in his way. Certainly the immediate obstacle of blindness. He couldn't see Jesus. He couldn't see him coming. He couldn't see where he was. But not just that, he also had the obstacles of the crowd itself. Did you notice when he's crying out for Jesus, well, what does the crowd do? They hush him. Settle down there, fella. Settle down. Don't, don't draw your attention. That, that's over the line. Quiet down, don't be so loud. And how does he respond to that? With more volume. That's how he responded to that. He responded to that with more volume. And so the question I want us to start with, why would he cry out this way? Why would he do that? Why would he make a scene? That's what he's done, right? I mean, let's get right down to it. That's what he has done here. He has made a scene. He screamed out for Jesus, and the people around him are bothered by that, and they tell him to calm down, and he screams out even louder. He has made a scene. He has stepped out all by himself when everyone else is telling him to be quiet. And so I want us to begin to think, why? Why would he do that? Now, don't think too hard. 
I've got a very simple mind, and I'm asking you to think simply with me today. Why would he do that? Why would he make a scene? Why would he scream out in the way that he screamed out? Well, the easy answer is he did that because he believed that this Jesus who was passing by could do something about his situation. What was his greatest problem? He's blind. And he believed that here was someone who could do something about it. And was he willing to make a scene because of that? Absolutely. Was he willing to be loud because of that? Absolutely he was. Was he willing to do whatever it took to get the attention of the one that he believed could do something about his greatest problem? Absolutely he was willing to do that. Jesus was the one who could do something. Hold your finger there in Luke chapter 18. Go back just a few pages again in the book of Luke to Luke chapter 4. It's a really interesting passage in Luke chapter 4 where you have Jesus. He's doing some teaching, but I want you to listen to what he says. In Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, it says that he came to Nazareth, that is Jesus, where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This is where Jesus chose to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to him, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so what Jesus is saying, the one that Isaiah is writing about that is here to do all of these things, including recover sight to the blind, that's me, that is the, I'm the one. And he's teaching this way, and he's proclaiming these things, and he's doing these things, and news about that is spreading throughout the region. And here you have this man who is blind, and he hears Jesus passing by, and he's thinking, what is my biggest problem? Blindness. And here is someone who can do something about it. The only one who can do something about it I will scream out for him. And the beauty is how does Jesus respond to his faith, right? Isn't that what it is? He believed that Jesus could do something about it. And Jesus responded to that faith. And he healed him. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story given to us here in Luke chapter 18. But it isn't the only story in that chapter. If you open the context up just a little bit, in Luke chapter 18, you find a contrast between this beggar who was blind and another story that a lot of us are probably familiar with, and you'll find it in this exact same context and the exact same chapter, the rich young ruler. I want you to think about this blind beggar and what we just learned about his reality in Luke chapter 18. Now we're going to read the story of the rich young ruler. And what I want you to do is I want you to be looking for contrasts between the two. In Luke chapter 18, beginning of verse 18, we're going to read down through verse uh, 23. But listen to this story. Look for the differences. It says in Luke 18, beginning of verse 18, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus said to him, Well, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. And so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Now again, a story that a lot of us are probably familiar with, but I want you to be thinking about the contrast. In this same context, two different men that Jesus came in contact with, two different circumstances, two different conversations, but Luke puts them next to one another because there is incredible contrast. For instance, you had the beggar that we just read about who was poor but then became rich, contrasted with the rich young ruler who was rich but then became eternally poor. You have this beggar who claimed no special merit. He openly admitted to Jesus his need. While you have the rich young ruler bragging about himself and his character. I've done all that. I've done that. I've done that. I've kept all that. I've followed all of those things. Two very different characters. Thirdly, you have the beggar who believed in Jesus and his power. And when healed, he glorified him and followed him. But yet this rich young ruler lacks that faith. He doesn't follow Jesus. He doesn't glorify Jesus. He goes away sorrowful. So what is the difference here? There's a great contrast for sure. There's multiple differences here up on the screen. But the difference is, the faith that they had. You see, their difference is their faith in Jesus, specifically what he can do and their dependence upon him. So what it does is it encourages us to put our trust in him, no matter what others say or do. Now, I want you to paint that picture. And you remember that Luke 18 blind beggar story that we expanded the context just a little bit to grab hold of the rich young ruler? Well, guess what? Let's expand that context out even further and grab all of Luke chapter 18. Now, we're not going to read the entirety of it, but I do want to direct your attention to a couple things. And maybe this week or later today, you can go back and read all of Luke chapter 18. But I want you to think about this story, this lesson, this principle up here on the screen, trusting in God no matter what others may say or do. At the very beginning of this chapter, you have a widow who was not discouraged in any way by the indifferent attitude of the judge. She's not bothered by that. She persisted in speaking with him. You have a tax collector who wasn't phased in any way by the hypocritical attitude of the Pharisee that was pointing his fingers down upon him as he prayed. You have parents who brought their little children to Jesus and did so in spite of the apostles' terrible attitude about that. When they're saying, hey, this is a problem, and they rebuked them even, that didn't stop them from bringing them to Jesus. And certainly what we had already read, this blind beggar coming to Jesus, even though the crowd urges him to be quiet. So the lesson in now all of this is Jesus responds to faith and he rewards those who have it. And so what difference is that going to make for us today? I want us to take this idea that we've seen in Luke chapter 18 multiple times and we're going to make two points this morning. Two points that I think can have a profound impact on the way we deal and communicate specifically with God. And the first of these two is this. We must have faith that expects the impossible. Now think about what this beggar asked for. He he didn't ask Jesus. Jesus, do do you have a a couple dollars? Do, do Do you have a little money with you? He didn't ask Jesus for that. He could have. 
He could have asked Jesus, can, can, I, can I follow you? You're taking care of these other men. Maybe you would take care of me. Can I follow you? Can I travel with you? He could have asked Jesus for that. He could have asked Jesus for a, a new cloak. He could have asked Jesus for new shoes. He could have asked Jesus for some food. He, he could have asked Jesus for a host of different things that Jesus probably could have provided him with. But he doesn't, does he? What does he ask from Jesus? Cure my blindness. The impossible is what he asks of Jesus. And no one is there. No one is curing blindness. Everyone would have thought, well, that is absurd. That is ridiculous if he would have asked anybody else, anyone else walking by, if they saw him asking for things, ask him, well, what can I do for you? And he would have said, you can cure my blindness. They would have laughed and mocked him for that. They would have said, no, nobody, nobody can do that. But what does he ask of Jesus? He asks of Jesus the impossible. You cure my blindness. This is exactly what I want. Now, I want you to understand, in this context, it's the point Jesus is making. Remember the rich young ruler that we were just talking about? We stopped reading in verse 23, but his story goes on. Certainly Jesus' teaching goes on a touch more. Do you think there's any coincidence that he speaks about the impossible? Look here in the same context. Luke chapter 18, beginning of verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, remember that's the rich young ruler, he goes away sorrowful. Jesus sees that. He takes the opportunity to teach. And what does he teach about? How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, well, who then can be saved? What did Jesus say? Verse 27. The things which are impossible with man are possible with God. You see, this is the, the, the lesson that we have. And it goes, I mean, from here into this beggar asking, cure my blindness, asking for the impossible. Well, here's someone who understands. It is impossible for man, but it's possible for God. So you have this. You see this throughout Scripture. In Luke chapter 1, oh, uh, still hold your finger in Luke 18, we'll come back to that. But look, look in Luke chapter 1, uh, when someone, a young woman, was saddled with a difficult situation. Mary is told, you're going to be with child. And the child is going to be put there by the Holy Spirit. And it will be the Son of God. A very difficult circumstance for her. And a confusing one. Because she hadn't known a man. She wasn't married at the time. And in Luke chapter 1, look at how all of this works itself out. In Luke 1, beginning of verse 34, it says that Mary said to the angel, this is after she's been told that this is going to happen, how can this be since I, I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that holy one who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. And listen, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Now, Mary answers, verse 38. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. How was she able to deal with that circumstance? How was she able to rectify all of that in her mind? How was she able to, to settle in her mind, I, I'm going to be pregnant even though I've not been with a man? How was she able to rectify that in her mind? Well, God operates in the impossible. How was that beggar okay with asking Jesus to heal his blindness? Because he believed Jesus operated in the impossible. Look to a passage in the Old Testament this time in the book of Jeremiah. A lot of places in the book of Jeremiah that we could go. I, I kind of whittled it down to this one place. 
in Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32 Uh, beginning in verse 17. I I love just the way this is phrased. He says, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. I love this phrase because of its bluntness. There is nothing too hard for you. I I love that. Look at what you've done. Look at what you've created. Look at what you maintain. Look at all of this. There's nothing that you can't do. There's nothing too hard for you. So we've got to have faith that expects the impossible. Secondly, and then we'll pull these two things together. Do not then underestimate what God can do. If we're going to have a faith that expects the impossible, we cannot under any circumstance underestimate then what God can do. The opposite of that, we need to have the confidence, the boldness to go to God with anything. Think about what John says in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. Listen to the wording of this. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Confidence. Where's that confidence? How do we grow that confidence? Faith. Faith is what grows that confidence. The belief that God can do the impossible. The understanding that I then cannot in any capacity underestimate what he can do. Faith has the power to do anything. Think about what's said in Matthew chapter 17. It's an incredible picture of faith and its power even given to us here in this text. Look at Matthew chapter 17. Think about this bit of teaching that we get from Jesus. Matthew 17 beginning in verse 14. He says, and when they had come to the multitude, this is Matthew 17, 14. A man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples. but They could not cure him. This is what Jesus says. He answered and said, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately. And they said, why why, why could we not cast it out? Listen to Jesus' response to that. He said to them, because of your unbelief. Okay, he goes on. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Faith as a mustard seed. The smallest of seeds even. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. What does that sound like? That sounds to me like the impossible. It sounds like that to Jesus too, because what's the end of that verse say? And nothing will be impossible for you. Why could we not cure this demon? Why could we not cast it out? Because you had no faith. If you had faith, even as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from this spot to this spot, because that is the power of faith. Most certainly it is the power of God. Because nothing then will be impossible. Is it easy to think that way? It isn't. So I'm going to help. 
with a quick exercise. I, I want you to take a moment, and I want each and every one of you this morning to think about your biggest, your biggest problem. Your biggest worry. Pick that one out. Think about your biggest problem. Think about your biggest worry. Think about your biggest issue. You think about that and you put it in your mind. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to do that. You think about what is your biggest problem. Your single biggest issue that you're facing right now. For that blind beggar in Luke 18, easy. Blindness. I can't see. It's his biggest issue. Did he have other issues? Yeah, I'm sure he did. That was his biggest one. What did he do about it? He took it to Jesus. What do we learn from that? Well, let's not get fancy. Let's not get fancy this morning. What do we learn from that? Our biggest issue, our biggest problem, our biggest worry... I want you to take that in your mind. I want you to take that in your mind, and I want you to set it down mentally. Set it on the floor. Set it on a table. Set it somewhere. And now I want you to then take God. And I want you to sit God next to that problem. On the table, on the floor, or wherever you set that problem, you take God and you sit him next to that problem. And you ask yourself the simple question, as you're looking at your problem, your biggest problem, as you're looking at God sitting next to it, you answer the question, who's bigger? Who's bigger? You see, there isn't a problem too big for God. There's not an issue too big for Him. There's not a worry that we have that is too big. For him to handle. Do you find yourself holding back from asking God what you really want and need? When we do that, are we underestimating what God can even do? Now, He operates in His time and He operates in His way. And he operates with his will. But all I can do is have faith that God can do the impossible even. And have faith enough to talk to him about that. Now there's one other passage that I want us to go to before we're done. We're going to look at it together. But I want you to be thinking here in just a moment. We're going to sing a song of invitation that Kayla is going to lead us in. And we're going to have an opportunity. And we're going to have an opportunity to think about God. And we're going to have an opportunity to think about what he can do. Ultimately, man's biggest problem is sin. And only God can take that away. Through the washing and the waters of baptism, that sin can be washed away so that we can have a relationship with him. That stands at the ready for you this morning. And maybe we can help you in some way. And when we sing this song, I want you to be thinking about that. But before that, one final verse. And to make sure we're all ready and in the ready position, you can close your Bibles. And I'm going to put the verse up on the screen. Everybody, let's go ahead and stand together. Let's have one more thought. One more thought together. Sometimes we think, well, if I've got a massively big problem, and Nate has a massively big problem, and Tim has a massively big problem, we take all of those massively big problems to God at the same time. Can, can, I mean, can he, can he handle all of our massively big problems? Do I have to take a number? Can he handle all of our problems? 
The question is, can we depend on him? What do we learn most about him? He is most dependable. He is most dependable. So we're going to read this verse together. A beautiful verse that really brings all of this home. And then we'll sing this song together. Maybe we can help in some way this morning. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning of verse 20, the Apostle Paul, in talking about God, and if he can be depended upon, he has this to say. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, listen, or think, According to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.